Okay. Um, what I would say is, like, because the law is never exact, um, and we'll get in later to the definition of what a person is, okay. uh, because that, that'll come up. Um, the law is never exact. So the court has to, they may be following a good law, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my example for this, which I think many lawyers would agree with, is uh, Wickard v. Filburn and Gonzalez v. Rach. Uh, those were cases where the Commerce Clause was uh, extended to cover, first, somebody growing wheat for their own consumption mm -hmm. was considered an act of interstate commerce, and in Rach it was uh, somebody growing for their own consumption was considered an act of interstate commerce. Okay. Well, the Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution is obviously a good, a good and necessary part of the Constitution, I would argue those were bad decisions made under that law. Okay. Uh, they didn't change, literally, the Commerce Clause, but the way they applied it, I would argue, was poor. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. This one I think you might bite me on. The president... I don't, well, on the last one... Well, okay, yeah. On the, so... <laughs> Without getting into more examples, um, first, let me restate what you've said, because um, yeah. it seems like you were talking about two things that are a little bit disconnected. So one is you say that the law is like, the law is never exact, right? I think we agree with that. A law yes. can't cover every single circumstance, for sure. And then you say that um, you bring up two decisions that were made um, with the Commerce Clause of the Constitution being cited, but you feel like the Commerce Clause was used in a way that was improper. Can you explain that a no, little bit more? I, 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 would, I would say it was used because the law is broad, it can be interpreted one of two ways. Okay. I don't like the way it was interpreted, so I would consider it bad. Okay. But there was nothing wrong. Like, literally, they followed the law. The law is good. I just think the way they followed the law was bad. Okay, sure. Okay. The only okay. thing, so, <laughs> I, 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 like, I think I have to agree with you here in, insofar as what you're saying is reasonable and laws are obviously always going to be inexact to some degree, obviously, even the constitution, right. is inexact to some degree, yes. of course. Um, the, the only like uh, yellow, yellow exclamation mark I would put here, or like a cautionary thing, which I'm also sure you would agree mm -hmm. is that if the law is too unexact, it would be scary if we required the Supreme court to clarify every single law rather than to merely do like, interpretation right that if if, yes. if we yeah we don't ever want to get in the business of passing a law and then relying on the supreme court to always do clarification that would be kind of spooky i think right yes yeah okay and, and, and I, I would argue that we do that uh, well you guys now because i'm no longer in the u.s but <laughs> okay. we do that a lot okay um, <laughs> okay can i ask okay. you for real um, quick then okay yeah so i'm gonna guess and i have a feeling my guess is going to be incorrect and then i want you to tell me why my guess was wrong my guess would be based on what you're saying you would have agreed with the original Chevron decision and you would disagree with the rejection of Chevron that just recently happened. But I feel like your answer is going to be the opposite of that. And then tell me why, or am it, I right? It actually is going to be the opposite of that. Um, because I feel like, and then my rationale would be that I feel like the original Chevron decision is embodying what you just said and that like, well, the law is never exact and there could be multiple interpretations. So as long as the, the original Chevron doctrine was basically as long as the executive's statutory construction is reasonable, then we'll let it stand as opposed to the court saying they have the one and final say over it. But you disagree with that. Why do you think that? I, well, yeah. I disagree because I think that the problem with the Chevron is that for executive branch agencies, the executive is running the, essentially taking the prosecution, prosecuting function and the uh, judicial decision-making function and doing them both. And if they also get to basically do the legislative function and decide what the law means, it's, it's a little too stacked against whoever the law is being applied toward. Sure. Um, there's generally a principle that um, laws are read uh, narrowly when you are trying to apply them against the person because you don't want them to have to guess what law they're supposed to follow. Yeah, especially in matters of criminal law, for sure. Like criminal exactly. like criminal law versus like civil procedure or whatever, the criminal law is much more simple to read and understand than like crazy tort shit, I think. Pr right, and if these reason. were just regulations where, you know, somebody might get a $10 fine, it wouldn't matter. But if they're regulations where somebody could end up in jail, that's, I, I, I don't, 
I don't think that's a good idea. Okay. I'm, I'm glad they changed it anyway. Sure. Put it that way. The only minor point I would fight on here, and maybe it's not worth it, yeah. I would say that to some degree, unless you can point like a really meaningful difference, to some degree, the executive is always engaged in some type of, um, I don't want to say judicial review, but some sort of legal construction, like literally the Office of Legal Counsel is there to make sure that they're trying to stay within the bounds of the law. They're, like they're doing some kind of legal interpretation when a law is passed by Congress and then they have to figure out a way to implement it, um, even if that's not. Right. Yeah. As Yeah. So I feel like they're always doing oh, some no, kind would, of. I would yeah. absolutely agree. I just would say that normally mm -hmm. in normal circumstances, you get to go to a court and say, look, they've they've interpreted it. They've come up with this. They're idiots mm -hmm. and uh, they're hurting me. Okay. Um, with the Chevron doctrine, you could go to the court and say that and say, like, well, you know, it's plausible. <laughs> so it how do you square? You. Yeah. How do you square that? I'm curious because so we start off this conversation with you saying that like the law is never exact, which I think we both agree. But Roberts's like principal argument under the overturning of Chevron was that there is only one best statutory uh, construction, and that should be in the purview of the, the Supreme Court ultimately to decide. Well, how do you, do you do you just like you don't you ignore I, that statement and you agree with the other parts or yeah obviously you don't have to co-sign every single it's part almost of his opinion. always what i do with roberts anyway okay sure okay okay that's fine okay okay gotcha i'll look at the holding and his reasoning is you really should just ignore it okay um okay it's the best thing you can do with Roberts' opinions I've gotcha okay so then i think okay so largely i think we're in agreement so laws aren't exact um the the last point that you made as we were leaving was um had to do Let's with see. um Oh, we were just going with a bad decision, and then we went off a little bit uh -huh. uh, separately from that. Okay. Um, okay. So next thing, which I'm hoping I can get you to agree with without too much struggle, but I'm, I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Okay. The president, as must any executive officer or agent, must have at least some level of crimin criminal immunity or... Um, must, as Sotomayor suggests in her dissent, mm -hmm. be read out of the law. Okay. This is a part where I think I'm going to totally disagree, but this might be the only thing that if you could flip my mind on this, I would be a lot more amenable to Roberts's decision. So this is probably like the big substance okay. of where we would have to well, yeah, fight. Yeah, go for it. This is, this is one of those where it's going to break your, your, break your common sense thought. Oh no. Okay. Um, I can I could give you an actual law, but it'll be easier if I just make one up that sure. you can trust me is close enough. And if you disagree with any part of it, well, so let's say a law for murder. Yeah. You've got with three or four elements. A person is element one mm -hmm. who kills another element two mm -hmm. with malice aforethought yep. element three. OK, that's it. Yes. Is guilty of murder. Mm hmm. Now there are um, affirmative defenses like uh, like uh, self defense, etc. Those would not apply in the in the case of a um, of the president, for example. Okay. So, can we agree, just looking at those elements, that most presidents are guilty, could be found guilty of murder, under that? Yeah, so the so the thing that would this is the thing that I feel would change this, and I, and I don't have the criminal law depth here, so uh, I'm going to ask you to help me navigate, which is a stupid yeah. idea because we disagree. So obviously you can lead me exactly where you well, want to. I, but, I'm going to do my mm -hmm. best to be yeah. uh, no, good yeah, of faith course, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the, okay. the thing that I'm looking at when the president makes a decision like this is the like that that mens rea component of the malice of forethought, the idea that a president ordering a military strike. I feel like he wouldn't satisfy that requirement in a similar manner as, and you can tell me if um, you, you can tell me if this is totally just not because we can drop this. But I'm thinking of something like, say, um, uh, uh, euthanasia, where a doctor is killing a human being with malice of forethought. He's literally injecting him with the thing, and it's like, okay, we know yeah. that this guy is going to die. Um, 
And and we and we can even if we want to make it because we can get rid of the consent thing. If we say it's a person in a coma who maybe is not going to wake up, so the person hasn't even necessarily consented to it, but maybe a family member has. In these right. circumstances, I don't think we would ever say, "Well, the doctor, you know, he needs to be shielded from criminal immunity." Because while well, he's clearly performing like this function that's assigned to him in this role in this job or whatever that like everybody's recognized. Yeah, yeah um, no, to make a similar argument for the president. Like, I'm yeah, go not for it. sure mm-hmm. if you're old enough to. Do you remember Terry Jack Shiva? Kevorkian? Oh fuck! No, Jack Kevorkian. Uh, I don't think so. Jack Kevorkian. Dr. Death, I believe, was his nickname back in the, was it 80s or early 90s? Oh, then absolutely not. I won't remember him, no. Oh, okay. He was someone who, before they had any laws that allowed it, Mm -hmm. he was doing assisted suicide. Okay. And he was prosecuted for murder. Okay. Because it is murder. (laughs) It meets all the elements of murder. Yeah, although I will say there is a really key clause there that you had which was before they have any laws that allow it i feel like if there's a well, law yes. that specifically outlines it or enshrines it I, then I, yeah go I, ahead yeah. and that would be exactly my point mm-hmm. unless there's some law that prevents the president from being prosecuted for murder say a supreme court opi- an opinion that gives him immunity he could be prosecuted for murder sure well hold on oh hold on <laughs> you just did a really okay. you did a really yeah. big boo-boo there okay you said well, if maybe. there was some law, well, or I'm sorry, I think you did. But you said if there was some law that prevented it, and then you said like a Supreme Court decision. Supreme Court decision is not a law, though. That's a big difference, well, right? Eh. Because if there was a law for it, this, it, every it, single it, thing it, that I, all my complaints would immediately disappear. If Congress passed a law saying, okay, well, the president, well, actually, would they be allowed to usurp the judicial like that? Well, I would be more okay with to, it. <laughs> but go for it. Go for it. Okay, yeah. This is where we have to go back to the common law because, okay, let me let me just tease your brain with something i'm going to cite from sotomayor's descent sure so in sotomayor's descent uh let's see where did i write the note so at page 16 of her descent Mm -hmm. for example he uh trump may be able to rely on a public authority exception from particular criminal laws Mm -hmm. and she's citing uh nardone v us um nardone was a case where The Supreme Court stated uh, it was a criminal case against some bootleggers, and they argued that the uh, federal agents couldn't testify against them because that would violate the wiretapping law that said you can't disclose private telephone communications. Okay. Okay. So just so you have a background of what the case was about. Okay. Um, So they were explaining that public officers may be impliedly excluded from statutory language embracing all persons. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Sotomayor saying that public officers may be impliedly excluded from language embracing all persons. Okay. The president is a public officer. Sure. Uh, So Sotomayor is citing a case that said that he could be impliedly excluded from any general applicability and... Any law of general applicability. Okay, sure. Um, it's a, I think that was crazy, but that's what she wrote. Um, I should note, Nardone is not a criminal case. Um, well, it's a criminal case, but it's not a criminal case as far as the uh, federal agents are concerned. Okay. Because it's just talking about whether evidence is admissible. Okay, um, sure. So I will say there's a lot of, um, uh, where there's a lot of like little pieces and stuff that um come up here um okay yeah. Let, okay so there's a there's a okay there's a few things that we have to uh, iron out as we move through this so one yeah. is um there's going to be huge or i think you would agree with this there's a big difference in how we should approach how we view like criminal versus civil liability that's one thing right yeah. right yeah. yeah okay we agree with that Absolutely, another thing yeah. is that um there should be a big difference between how we view like uh, affirmative defenses versus like immunities that can win on interlocutory appeal, right? That you can like dismiss a yes. whole case before anything, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and that um, there should be, um, okay, I, I, I'll have a second question for you. Uh, we can get to that in a, in a little bit, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. Let's... So coming back to the, um, or no, okay, go. Yeah, keep going if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, so the actual words of Nardone were this. Mm-hmm. 
that where public officers are impliedly excluded from language embracing all persons is where a reading which would include such officers would work obvious absurdity as, for example, the application of a speed law to a policeman. Sure. So this is, I think, getting to what you were talking about. Okay, yeah. And it gets to the... Uh, what what we think of as a common sense, obviously you couldn't arrest a police officer for speeding, mm -hmm. but there's not actually a law that says that. Sure, I agree with that, yeah. So, but my question is going to be, and you can incorporate this into an answer if you want, because yeah, this, this is going to be my question. Yeah. Because my, my next question, or at some point I'm going to ask you, well, if the president needs immunity from criminal liability, why shouldn't all police officers have immunity? How can they do their jobs without that immunity? And then go for it. You're kind of, yeah, uh, go. Okay, mm -hmm. and I would argue that they already have it. Okay. Um, okay. So if you think about any time someone is, someone uncooperative is arrested. Okay. At least in Florida, because that's the only state I, I looked up just because you happened to be there and I figured that would be useful. Mm -hmm. They have committed a battery, which yep. ugh, I don't remember the exact um, elements, but it's basically um, touching another person uh, yeah. without their consent, blah, yeah. blah, blah. It's, it's clearly satisfied any time a police officer takes a suspect, an uncooperative suspect, into custody. Mm -hmm. Do you think that any police officer could then be charged with battery? Yes. And I think that's, a, think so? I think that's a big difference. So, um, th so this is the big part that we disagree on, okay? Now, okay, I will yes, say that absolutely. factually, <laughs> factually, I am correct here. So we'll see you wiggle out of this one, okay? That okay. I think that, and this might be, ooh, I, so I put this in my notes to research, okay? Uh, so I have a very poor understanding. But I think this might be um, what, or this is what qualified immunity, I think, gets at. That there's like a public exception rule or something that when a police officer is doing their job and they're performing their job in a way they're expected to be, they can't be criminally prosecuted for it. But uh, I think if a police wait, officer can I correct no, you? Yeah, go Just correct me. Go. Yep. Qualified immunity is solely has to do with civil liability, has nothing to do with criminal. Okay, then liability. toss, then eject what I just said. I was fucking retarded then. Okay. okay. Um, there's, there must be something then that protects police while they're in the <laughs> function of their job from criminal yes. liability. But if they step too far outside the bounds of that, yes. they are absolutely criminally liable. So obviously, I, and so this would be Derek Chauvin or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so, what, so can you tell me, me what is the legal, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, yeah let, me, let me get to it because it's all flowing from this... Uh, I would, I would never have even read Nardone. It's okay. a stupid case from way too long ago. But Sotomayor cited it. Uh, <laughs> so I did. Um, and they are relying on a case uh, called Balthazar via versus uh, Pacific Electric Company from 1921. And in Balthazar, the court wrote, it must be conceded that the language of the Motor Vehicle Act in fixing speed limits, uh, this was actually about a fire truck, uh, <laughs> Okay. In fixing speed uh, limits and regulating the use of public streets is broad enough to apply to a motor fire truck responding to a fire alarm. But a familiar and fundamental rule of construction requires that this general language shall not be construed to apply to the government or its agencies unless explicitly included by name. The general rule is stated by Blackstone as follows. I shall only further remark that the king is not bound by any act of parliament unless he is named therein by special and particular words. The most general words that can be devised, any person or persons, bodies, politic or corporate, etc., affect him not the least, if they may tend to restrain or diminish any of his rights or interests. Um, and there's a citation if you want it, um, to the commentaries. Okay. So this is, this is what they're citing. And this, this commentary is getting to sovereign immunity, which is the concept that the government, the original sovereign immunity, because sovereign was king, mm -hmm. that the king can't be sued without his permission. The sure. king can't be charged with a crime. Um, and it's the same concept that a police officer who is acting in his role as a police officer mm -hmm. is immune from being charged for doing his job as an agent of the government. So I feel like I don't know how the defense works here. I know it's not an yeah. affirmative defense because it's not brought up in court. However, this isn't an immunity because I think a court can still look at this. And that's fundamentally different, I think, than the new category of stuff that Roberts has created. Because 
Obviously, we've seen police officers that do get charged with crimes in the commission of their job because ultimately, I guess it's because a court has decided they've stepped so far outside the bounds of their job that they cannot be charged with a crime. That yes. So whatever is applying, whatever, I, and I don't know the legal, I don't know well, what's allowing that to happen legally, but whatever is happening there, it cannot happen with the president in the way that Roberts has said. He I, scratched out something more unique. I would disagree with that. Um, okay. I don't believe that he actually did do that. I believe that courts have sort of a gatekeep, at least from my recollection of reading it, have a gatekeeping function in that they get to decide, was it a, uh, I forget the exact phrase, uh, let me scroll up to the holding. For um, which case, for the Trump v. US? Uh, Trump v. U. yeah. Um, I was just trying to remember the exact words they used Pre for... Preclusive uh, and conclusive, or... No, oh, what is uh, holding? Absolutely immune from criminal prosecution for conduct within his exclusive fear, sphere of constitutional authority. Yes. That was it. Exclusive sphere of constitutional authority. Yep. Um, so that has to go before a judge before they can dismiss the case. Was this within the president's exclusive sphere of um, constitutional authority? Okay. If it, if it was, then the judge kicks it. Yep. But that would, but that would go before a judge. Well, it has to. There's no other way because you would first file the indictment or, uh, you know, depending on what state or whatever um, charges. And then the judge would have to decide, OK, was this act w within one of those three categories, private sure. action? So, yeah. well, so, OK, holy, OK, well, now I want to be really careful when we say goes before a judge because there's because yep. we're at different parts of the. Right, a judge can make a final ruling. This would definitely be a preliminary judge. hearing. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I, if I even like the word preliminary. These are things that could be used theoretically to like, like this would be like your your first response to a complaint that includes nothing beyond saying like I'm quoting two parts of the Constitution. The act is this, and then we're done. We don't even talk about this anymore. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so the, I guess the issue here is that um, the, the issue is that like wh whatever police officers enjoy, it's not that, right? That goes way yeah. further than what a police officer would enjoy, right? Now, maybe you could still make the argument that it's still okay, but I think that's, that's way beyond yeah. what a police officer, right? Okay. Yes. And I, I would agree it's way beyond. Mm -hmm. I would also argue, though, that <clears throat> as compared to a police officer, the president has uh, powers to violate laws that police officers just can't even imagine. <laughs> Potentially, like, yeah. Sure. The president literally could order an assassination, like murder for hire. Potentially, basically. yeah. I a don't know if that's can been. Never do that. I don't know if that's I mean, been. There is just no no situation where a police officer could ever do that. Um. Yeah. Sure. I don't know if the I don't know if the president is allowed to do that to like an American on American soil. That might be a due process issue. <laughs> but um. I, yeah. I, um. Yeah. I would argue that probably. Well, I, certainly under this case, he can. Sure. Um, <laughs> but, 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 okay, wait, but then, hold on. So then, um, another, another issue that I have is that um, before we even hit pretrial stuff, yes. can you, do you know the process of, um, of going to a grand jury? No. Okay. Um, uh, do you, the state I was in didn't even have grand juries, so I have no idea how that works at all. Okay. <laughs> do you think that it would be problematic or troublesome for investigators to even get evidence to go to a grand jury if you've got like absolutely immune acts i don't th i don't think so that was one of the things is i don't believe all of the talk about evidence that they made in the case i think is completely um pointless. unenforceable or what exactly well it's not binding on any lower court so theoretically a case could arise that raises the issue of um, uh, what was it? The uh, discussions with um, was it with the AG? Yeah, yeah. There could be a case that arises in the future on whether that evidence is admissible or not. But that wasn't this case. So well, it would be hard. But I mean, didn't Roberts explicitly bucket off that? Doesn't matter. <laughs> as, as that's why, like the first thing they teach you in law school, like your first class, legal research and writing is how to do a case brief. And the first thing is you identify the question presented and then the answer. And if it doesn't fit into the answer to the question presented, it, 
It's complete. It's dicta. It's hold it's, on. Wait, wait. Are you really going to say that? Any- you really think that the writing of Roberts in the majority opinion on the specific facts before the the court in the case that that all the but writings that's on that not are the dicta? question they were asked is the problem. The only thing there, the only authority they have is to answer questions presented. Um, you got into this some with the discussion of uh, standing. Um, you you have to have a case or controversy. The controversy is literally the question presented. If they're answering something else, that is outside their authority. But then why would he remand? Why would he have to explicitly say that he would remand anything to the lower courts if he if his well. Sure. The the ruling as far as immunity that overruled the um, D.C. Circuit Court, that obviously needed to be remanded so that they could. Uh, um, well, yeah, but he was he, I'm saying he was remanding the facts of the case as well to the lower courts because he was saying yes. they need to engage in this like immunity, the presumptive immunity analysis before yes. we can have any consideration here as well. Right. Even if I were I. I, I would have to do like a, I guess a reading on, I don't know what the fuck textbook you guys would use for like what counts as dicta versus holding or whatever. But like, even if I, even if I were to agree with you that this, that this writing was not dicta, that this was not part of the holding, which I'm not sure if I, I don't know enough to disagree with you. Okay. So fuck you. But like, okay. even if I were to say that it wasn't, isn't that like such a huge signal to the lower courts that it if you're a prosecutor a huge signal, <laughs> yeah, one, the lower court could toss it just based on the dicta writings. And two, um, because we have, seen, right, we agree justices do do that. They'll quote dicta from cases, even yeah, if they should, yes. right? Okay, so that one, and then two, if you're a prosecutor, you're probably just not going to even waste your time on that anyway, because it's like, okay, well, even if I think that is dicta, and even if these lower courts do uphold it, I mean, like, Roberts has already well, signaled to me. Well, somebody's going to test it anyway, just to... Uh, Maybe eventually, yeah, but, case. like, you're already in um, hot water with this ca- with this case, and now the court has signaled yeah. <laughs> to you that, like, we would consider this absolutely immune, and so like, okay, well, fuck me, I guess, like... Yeah. So I feel like it's going to get dropped regardless. So in practice, it's basically part of the holding, even yeah, if you're it's, saying it's, it isn't necessarily uh, part of yeah. the holding. But. Well, like I said, I, I'll defend the holding. I, I can't defend the stupidity of Roberts. <laughs> sure. <There's, laughs> um, because, because, so let me, uh, uh, let's see, what were we? Oh, we were still dealing with, um, with whether uh, a president needs criminal immunity. Yeah, we were kind of on I that. I forgot yeah. where we were <laughs> Sure. for a second. Um and my and okay. my basically my big push to this, and this is probably my largest problem with the case. So yeah, like if you talk about this, basically is that like I don't believe that the president of the United States like needs to commit crimes to do his job or things that could even be misconstrued as crimes. Like I feel like there's enough like explicit well, constitutional law and like legislative law where it's like he's clearly functioning within the bounds of the law and what's allotted to him. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Well that so that's why I brought up the case of for example, the police officer that is committing battery every time they Yeah. But the police officer is as explicitly you, you in, agree with you agree with that that every police officer could be put in jail. Theoretically, yes, he could be. Well, hold on, fuck. We have to be See, careful. I don't say, think any police officer would ever sign up if they could be. Okay, hold on. We got, when you say could, that's a word that means a lot of things. When you say legally, that Well, hold that on. I'm saying when you say, say a new uh, DA comes in, who's tough on cops and who knows yeah yeah wait, um, wait, when you say could be i mean that like all of that behavior is up for review but the, the vast majority of it would fail because they would be within their job as like a police officer i don't mean could be as wait, in like a, that, a new day could well, come in and arrest every police officer i don't think are that's you saying possible. they have immunity for their core uh functions um if you want to call it immunity, it's we have to have a different immunity than what the president is being given because oh, none right, of it because they don't they don't as far as they they cannot even though they meet all the elements of the crime, they cannot actually be convicted of that crime. Um, correctish, yeah. But I don't, okay. I don't know if it's the same. It's not the same type of immunity because no, it's all I, I up agree. For, it's not the yeah. same, same uh, exact thing. Like I said, I would argue that the president, because the president can do such crazy things, there are different rules. Sure. I'm just saying that, uh, like, any cop, like, here, they you, come from the same, you agree with this. Say, any police officer yeah. at any point in time, all of their stuff is up for 
judicial review, right? Any cop killing any suspect ever. Like, I imagine the department yeah. will do a first pass. I imagine what it looks like is the department does a first pass where they see, like, okay, where all the policies and procedures follow, seems like everything was, or maybe they say, okay, well, seems like it wasn't. And then at that point, then a district attorney might look at it, like, okay, well, seems like something wasn't followed. Now I'm going to look at the fact pattern here. I'm going to say, okay, well, do I feel like this guy, his behavior, like, rose to some either malice of forethought or some, like, reckless, willful, reckless endangerment, some murder to murder, whatever. Um, and then he might decide to bring charge. But all of this at every stage, at no point ever, here's what I'll say, okay? Because it's hard for me to make the strong yeah. someone on the other side saying like, oh yeah, they have here's what I would say. At no point ever, and I think you would agree with this, no cop ever thinks he's immune from criminal prosecution while doing his job insofar as like he can do whatever and like his behavior is beyond question, right? I would, uh, I would quibble. I would say that I think every cop believes that as long as he is properly performing his job, he is immune from prosecution for performing his job. Sure. But he's but it's not like beyond okay. question. And if he fucks it up enough, he's he could right. get charged. And I right? would, yeah. Well, and I would argue that the holding in uh, Trump v. United States is basically the same. It's saying, look, if you're acting now, mm -hmm. we can the way Roberts phrased things. Um, <laughs> I can't defend, um, but the actual words themselves. So let me just read uh, what the holding, at least as in my opinion, is. Sure. Um, and you can always disagree if you think it's different, but I'm, I believe it's correct. Mm -hmm. The president is absolutely immune from criminal prosecution for conduct within his exclusive sphere of constitutional authority. He has a presumptive immunity from criminal prosecution for acts within the outer perimeter of his official responsibility and for unofficial acts, he has no immunity. Okay. Um, okay. Here, can we, cause we're right now, I we're would say that is the statement of the law, so to speak. Like if, sure. if a court was going to like, look, we need, what is the test? Mm -hmm. This is the test that a lower court has to follow. Yeah. So here's my issue. Okay. So, cause right now yeah. I don't even think that, I don't even think the first bucket is the big problem. I think the presumptive immunity bucket is the big problem. Right. But, Probably it, is, it, yeah. this, <laughs> but if we look at the absolute one, okay, this is, this is my issue. And honest to God, if Roberts hadn't bucketed any of this behavior, I might be okay with this part of the holding. Okay. If you're telling okay. me that we cannot criminally indict a president for doing things that are like explicitly and specifically allotted to him as his like core function power as the executive, I would almost say, I don't even know why this is before the court. Obviously this is the case. You can't yeah. like, like if a, if a president were to fire somebody or hire somebody, or if the president were to be functioning as the commander in chief, you know, Bush can't go to jail for murdering, you know, too many Afghanistan. So like, obviously that's, I wouldn't even know why the court is addressing this, right? The yeah. issue that I have, the issue that I have is that there are two parts to it that I remember. One is that you can't even take into account the motivations for the behavior, which is odd, I think, number one. And number two, that when he bucketed that behavior, when he bucketed that behavior, he included something that in my mind is so clearly outside of the bounds of his core executive function that now I don't know what the fuck Roberts meant when he said that. Right. That's, that's my yes. big issue because and yeah, I, I know yeah. right what you're talking about because it, it was one of those things where I was like, would you just shut the fuck up? And uh, this was a great holding. If you just <laughs> didn't do any of that stupid. Uh, sure. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, but then, yeah, but then at this point I, I would almost say like, because it, because if that's how the absolute immunity part is being read in my world, I would say that like the court would never even answer this question because it's almost self-evident. You're never going to like, we're arresting president Bush because he did the Iraq war or we're going to arrest yeah. uh, Donald Trump because he raised taxes and he's stealing from Americans that way. So like we would never, right. that would just never happen. It's not. So, yeah. yeah. Now, so, so assuming that the first part is read that way, the second part with mm -hmm. the presumptive immunity. Yeah. Um, I, I view that, or at least I read it as essentially equivalent to, um, uh, shoot, we were just talking about this a second ago, uh, qualified immunity, except in a criminal context in that police officers are presumed immune from a lawsuit unless you can show that they acted unreasonably sure, um, or another police officer acting reasonably, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, from civil lawsuits, right? But go ahead. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm saying this is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but using the same kind of standard that look, we're going to assume that as long as he's acting 
in an official capacity, mm -hmm. not like a really official, but like it's official. Um, we're going to presume that's immune from prosecution. I don't necessarily see a problem with that. The and I'm big curious, issue. Uh, what what your yeah? The huge issue that I had was um, one is that's a pretty wide category. I almost yeah. could see when we say like reasonable minds could disagree. It's like one reasonable mind out of like fifty, maybe okay, but maybe okay. The biggest issue that I had here was that, and maybe you're, maybe you can tell me this is a this is a dicta. It didn't it wasn't part of the holding? Was it seemed like one of Robert's tests for that presumptive immune category was if investigating this would ever impede on the executive's ability to do this action in the future, it's given immunity. That standard seems insane to me because it's, now every president, because the evidence, yeah. because the issue that I have is like, uh, you ever buy a house? Yes. <laughs> One of the things that uh, I, I thought, I, I was told this when I, when I was doing uh, home, home appraisals, I thought it was kind of funny. You, you have to get an appraisal obviously before a bank would cut you a loan because they're not gonna give you a loan for a thing way outside the value. And I remember asking the home inspector, you know, we do the home inspector and then my uh, realtor comes out and I'm like, hey, what if they appraise the house and it's like way fucking different than, you know, what I'm willing to pay for? Like, are we like fucked or whatever? And they're like, no, because the bank is gonna look at the equivalent value of the homes in your neighborhood and then also, you're willing to pay this much for it. So it's pretty easy to appraise it at this amount, assuming it's not wildly right. different. And I'm like, oh, I guess that makes sense. This, this is because I am willing to pay this for it. When you look at like that test that Roberts gives, well, if a president feels like they would be heavily impeded by their ability to perform executive functions in the future based on criminal probes here, then we can't like target that. Well, damn, isn't that convenient for the president who has a case coming before the court to say like, well, hold on, if you guys are going to question yes. this, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do this shit in the future, guys. Like, what? well, now, well, now, yeah. who do you cite? I mean, um, the fucking president himself is saying he's going to be gated in the future, right? I feel like that's a really yeah. hard one. Yeah, go. Yeah, and I would agree. And this is where I, I'll bite a bullet that I don't think, because I'm not a Republican, mm -hmm. I don't think any of the Republicans will. I think that this goes far uh, greater as far as allowing or offering immunity to presidents than they're willing to admit. I, I, I have no doubt that uh, that sort of thing would be immune. But let me, uh, uh, let me uh, point something out. Okay. In Nixon, it now granted this is dicta because, again, it's never actually arisen before the court. Mm -hmm. But in Nixon... Um, where was that quote? Uh, um, the Fitzgerald one, right? Yeah, Nixon v. Fitzgerald. Yep, okay. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, okay. There are incidental powers belonging to the executive department which are necessarily implied from the nature of the functions which are confided to it. Among these must necessarily be included the power to perform them. The president cannot, therefore, be liable to arrest, imprisonment, or detention while he is in the discharge of his duties of his office. So while he, during his term, basically, uh -huh. he is immune, completely immune from any criminal prosecution for anything. Not just for his official acts. That might be the case, yeah. But there were literally, we've got memos from the OLC that says as much, right? I'm not sure if you can indict right. like a sitting and president for criminal charges, sure. Which, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine some little bumfuck town um, arresting the president for speeding? When he, like, this is just absurd. No, you can't do that. Well, would I would be... Want, you would never want that to be able to happen, I don't think. Well, I'd be careful um, of that. I'm not, I don't actually know what the answer that would be, because if it was a state doing the arresting, I don't know if any of the... If these holdings would necessarily carry over to states doing it, right? Uh, yeah, they definitely... Uh, that Does would it? be one of those um, things where... Uh, they did have, oh, I can't remember the name of the case, um, but this has happened with federal agents where states are trying to, um, have tried to prosecute federal agents. Okay. And they like, like, you can't interfere with the federal government doing its job. <laughs> like, okay. That's not okay. They may be violating your state law, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> they're, they're doing what they're, we require them to do. Um, so, uh, okay. but anyway, so... The president can do horrible things and not be and still maintain office as president and still be <laughs> commanding the military. And um, so it's not like it's absurd that the president could uh, could commit uh, crimes that everyone would agree are horrible. 
and, and not be prosecuted, at least for up to eight years. Why do you say for at least up to eight? Are you just saying while he's in office? That's his term of, right, maximum term of office. Okay, sure. Okay. So I don't think it's that crazy to say, well, if the president did something that was ostensibly within his, uh, the powers of his office, he might not be able to be charged with that. I don't know if I like the jump there. I think there is a very compelling reason why. Um, Okay, so here, okay, here is a balance that I wish Roberts would have done. This is probably my biggest complaint about the case that he doesn't. You've heard probably heard me explain this. The biggest balance that I don't like um, that Robert didn't do was he he does the, okay, well, he has civil immunity, therefore he should have criminal immunity, and then that's it. Um, And he's only looking at, like, the the civil penalties are bad. Well, the criminal penalties are even worse. So if he's got uh, immunity from the civil penalties, obviously he should have immunity from the criminal penalties. But then he doesn't consider the other side of that where, well, you know, somebody might want to sue the president. Uh, so, you know, we're going to say they can't sue, but that's, you know, whatever. But if the state or the federal government wants to hold him, you know, liable for a crime, there, that's, there's a much larger interest there. We don't want a president that commits crimes. We don't want a, a government that can't hold somebody accountable for a crime. Um, right. Now, I think there is probably a compelling argument to be made for not holding a sitting president, for not indicting a sitting president. There's probably a compelling claim there, I think. And it might be argued, you could probably argue it on both sides, but I think one of the more compelling things is that you could impeach him. If there's like a serious, like, holy shit, the president is out of control, theoretically, maybe, you could impeach the president, right? Say, fuck this, okay, this is insane. Um, Although we might be able to imagine circumstances where maybe we even should arrest him because it's so crazy. But we'll we'll say, like, at least we have impeach him. (laughs) But I think that to argue that once the president is out of office— He's still beyond criminal prosecution. I think we have to show at that point that the president needs to feel like while he's in office, he can escape office without any criminal liability, that he needs that in order to do his job. And my biggest argument would be I don't feel like any president historically has ever run with that assumption. And we've been, we nuked countries, we've done wars, we've done all sorts of things. And it doesn't feel like any president has ever felt the need for that that's never risen in their, in their office. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can't disagree with that. I don't think the U S has ever had a president that was as awful as uh, Donald Trump. So I, yeah. Um, not, but well, I'm not going to say as awful, but I'm saying doing things that, so for instance, right. Uh, and you well, tell me I mean, if, awful in every set, like, obviously he's committing crimes. Yeah. But, but I'm saying like it, it, things that we would want to protect. Right. So like my example right. would be like Obama. If Obama had the same idea around uh, criminal immunity as Trump did, do you think Obama would have ever tried to get clarification from the OLC about whether or not he could do that assassination or that hit on the um, the bombing of the uh, the the, ta- the Taliban guy, I think, or whatever? Like, do you think he would have even I, I bothered? Would, I, I would hope so. But that's why I think Trump is particularly awful. I think Obama um, respected the office and institutions where he would have done that if for no other reason than to appear above board. Yeah, but if if we were in a world where he really wanted to do something, like, I guess, what, hmm. I feel yeah, like if um, well here here's the issue then for every single behavior I can cite you could just say well maybe they just wanted to appear above board but I, I could even I could equally cite I was like they all they probably thought there was some sort of liability there or there was some sort of you know well fuck can I really can I really do this and escape completely scot free I think I feel like the Jack Smith cites this in a lot of his arguments that um, Fitzgerald I'm not Fitzgerald I'm sorry Nixon accepting the pardon and the preemptive pardon seemed to imply that the president could be criminally liable for stuff. I just, yes. I feel like, well, I feel, yeah, I feel like Roberts no needed to cite that, that, yeah. that, that Roberts needed to show that presidents actually feel impeded by their ability to perform their core functions because of criminal courts. And I don't feel like presidents have ever had that feeling before. Uh, yeah, well, I don't, I don't think they have. But then again, I don't think, I think that most presidents would assume the same as, like I said, I think most police officers would assume as long as they're doing their job. Yeah. That they can't be prosecuted for doing their job. Sure. Which is why I generally agree with the holding, even if I disagree a lot with the way uh, Roberts has applied the holding um, to the facts. And, yeah, I might tinker with the language a little. I think that it makes, um, the holding itself makes perfect sense 
if you read it that way, that, look, if he's doing his job, we should at least presume that he's immune. Um... Which is I all mean, like I, I agree, yeah, means, but it's just really is. yeah, but the issue has to do more with the like that test that he puts in there of if this could ever impede on an executive's yeah. ability to do something. That's just such an ins- I don't know what that's sta- well. I'm gonna say I was about to say that's a crazy standard, but I guess it hasn't been tested yet, so we don't know. But that feels on its face like an insane standard. Yeah. Um, it, also, it probably, he never addresses this. Is. He never oh, yeah. he never addresses this, which I feel would be like the first thing you would address is. What if I want him to feel impeded, right? You want criminal yeah. law to influence people to some extent. Wouldn't, what, yeah. Well, yes. Although the problem is, and this is, was actually um, really interesting. If you, if you do start reading Supreme Court cases, I can't recommend enough listening to oral arguments. Yeah, we did for this case, because actually. You, yeah, for the Trump. Yeah, v, because US you get one. to understand how each judge is thinking and the questions that they ask and whether they're asking questions because they want an answer or because they're trying to make their point known or all mm-hmm. that stuff. Yeah. Um, but they did uh, uh, cover that um, in the oral... Fuck. Wait, where were we? Well, they we? did... Hold on. When you say they cover that in the oral arguments, they... Um, the you're, Are you talking about... Wait, fuck. Which, what were we just talking about before this? That's... Um, I just got lost. <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, no. I was saying that you want a president to feel impeded by criminal stuff. Yes. Um, I don't, did that ever yes. come up? And Did any of the six answer that? Yes. Or was this just uh, Sotomayor was, or Kagan uh, or somebody I, like rambling? Did I quote it? I did. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was actually um, during, they were questioning Trump's uh, uh, attorney. Yep. And, Who was they? Which um, one? Uh, it was Kagan. Okay. Was, uh, okay. Well. But it was during the first initial uh, questioning of him. Sure. Um, So he's answering her, for the president to communicate with states on a matter of enormous federal interest and concern, he's talking about the um, uh, uh, trying to get Trump off for uh, telling the states they had to find him votes, I believe. Sure. (laughs) Attempting to, (laughs) but but we're phrasing it differently, attempting to defend the integrity of the federal election, to communicate with state officials and urge them to view what he views as their job under state law and federal law, law, that's an official act. And Kagan, well, attempting to defend the integrity of the election, I mean, that's the defense. The allegation is that he was attempting to overthrow an election. Yeah. And uh, Sauer, uh, the attorney, essentially exactly right. And neither allegation of what the purpose is should make a determination, should make a difference as to whether it's immune. Yeah. So that that is something I actually would partially, or at least I, I see where he's coming from. I might not agree with it, but I see it. Because we can't presume that uh, criminal defendants are guilty before they're found guilty. I understand what you're saying, but we're not assuming guilt. Well, hold you on. kind of are. If well, hold on, careful, because no, no, because what, what you're saying, what you're <laughs> yeah. saying here, makes it sound like every single indictment assumes guilt, right? It kind of does it, to some extent. We're not assuming a guilty verdict, but of course, an indictment that's laying out facts, you're prima facie alleging that you've committed a crime, which is a guilty thing, right? I mean, like yes. that's these are the facts of the case. Well, here's the law. That's, here's that's right? just what. Yeah, that's just what the prosecutor's saying. Yeah, but as far as if the court rules based on um, him having done this before it's been proved that he has committed the crime true but the issue that i have here again is it's not about the court proving we're on interlocutory appeal here we're, we're on we're on pre right. we're on like pre 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 trial we're like yes we haven't gotten to consider anything this is like pre right. good you're gone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the issue that i have like there's so like this exact same ruling all done as an affirmative defense, I think I'd be fucked. I'd say like, ah, eh, I don't know about that, but fine, whatever. I think I'd be fully on board, whatever. E- even if I don't like it as much, it'd be like Chevron. I'd be like, okay, fine, I guess. Okay, sure. Affirmative defense, I get this. It's the fact that this is so strong before trial, before, uh, and, and then and then how broad it is too, that like you can't use this. So for instance, you can't use these uh, to prove any other crime, and you can't look at the motivations b- b- of any of these actions as well. My, well, I would I would okay. disagree with the not being able to use it as evidence. Well, you, but I've already, I think I've already oh, lodged that disagreement. Oh, because you're saying that that's dicta. You're saying that doesn't count. Well, because this case had nothing to do with evidence. Well, no, but it did have to do with like what absolute immunity meant, right? And he said that absolute immunity meant that it couldn't be used as evidence for other crimes because that would defeat the whole purpose of the absolute immunity. Wasn't that his argument? Yeah. Uh, 
It might have been his argument, but it doesn't... He wasn't ever asked to answer that question is the problem. Wait, okay, well, hold on. Why does this distinction matter? If, if the Supreme Court justices write this and future ones can cite to it, why do you think that this... Hold but on. That, Wait, but does dicta every, matter at all? I feel I don't know if dicta actually matters at all because people will because Supreme Court just will cite to other things and they'll say they're like, oh fuck it, they said it, it, right? Like it matters to a lower court in that uh, a lower court is bound by the actual ruling. They're not bound by anything that is not part of the holding. Okay, but if that was the case, if it was really that strong, I don't even know if I agree with what you're saying there. I don't have the background to disagree with you, but like the thing that I'm going to is um the uh, the Mar-a-Lago case is the lowest. That's the low. That was a um, federal uh, district court, right? The Mar-a-Lago yeah. case. <laughs> she tossed yep. that case based on. You would agree that Thomas's writings it was, on the special uh, obviously dicta. Yeah, it had obviously nothing to do with the case. What? Okay, so then, so that's that's an example of a whole of criminal case being tossed because yes. of completely dicta writing, right? So it seems yeah. like it still, I, it does I, affect everybody, right? I don't know how you can say that, like, um, well, the holding part now, is the only thing that matters, it, and then the dicta part, because there's no point where it'll well, ever go before the Supreme Court, and they'll say, well, even though we all agree with this, we have to, we, this was like marked as dicta in behind the scenes, and now we know that we can't well, rely on this, right? Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me push back on that a bit. Go ahead. Because if you read the opinion by the, um, or that's not really an opinion, the decision by the Florida judge, um, she wasn't, she cited it, for its reasoning, she didn't cite it as an authority. And then she went on to, at least in her mind, defend the opinion, the decision. Sure, but I mean, su so citing to a Supreme Court like opinion, even though it was just a concurrence, a dicta concurrence, I mean, it still strengthens her, her... Oh, it does. But I would argue that the reason it strengthens it is that people have faith in the uh, legal reasoning ability of the Supreme Court justices. So even if they write something that is not anything to do with the case, they, it might be cited because it's showing some uh, some legal scholar who, in the U.S., the Supreme Court are basically the highest you can get as in the legal profession, says that this is a good reading of the law. Okay, I, so my two parts is, or my, my two parts of this is one is I don't know if this huge distinction between dicta and the holding is as important as as you're saying it is. I, I, but I, I don't have the background to even disagree with you. But then the second thing is yep. I don't know if I agree that the um, we were talking about before this Robert saying that the absolute immunity can't be used as evidence for another thing. How would that not be part well, of the holding? Well, it wasn't the absolute immunity. It was um, it was the um, well, the I think conversation. he said conversation couldn't be used. Well, he was saying, but he, but the, uh, yeah, but the argument was that was the individual fact, but the, the whole, the law, the holding, the interpretation is that what he was saying was that acts that are absolutely immune cannot be used as evidence for another crime because that would defeat the purpose of the absolute immunity. How is that not like the holding? Like that could never change, right? If that's what he's declaring absolute immunity to be, and this is the question before the court, and he's talking about what the absolute immunity is, how would that not be part of the holding opinion? Okay, let me let me yeah, think go for about it. that because I hadn't actually considered. <laughs> it just sounds so retarded that I hadn't actually considered that. <laughs> sure. That also, be. I will say in uh, in macro right now. Okay, and I appreciate the conversation, yeah. but it is disappointing if the only defense for the opinion is that we have to do the most absolute razor thin narrow reading of it ever, and then assume that all the extra legal, all the retarded shit that Roberts wrote was dicta, that 90% of the opinion is not counted. Because if that is true, then well, I maybe I mean, would agree but, with the opinion. But like at that point, it's like not even a real opinion, because I don't think anybody even cared about this before. Like, can you charge the president with a crime for like being the commander in chief? Probably not. Like nobody even had these questions before them before. Like nobody even right. thought about this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would, so I wouldn't say that none of the rest of the opinion matters. It matters as far as Trump is concerned. Like the dicta is not the dicta distinction only matters for future cases. For this case, I think it's a bad decision um. or a bad um, application of the rule. But okay, the rule but if the itself, rule was created for this case, isn't the, the the court that would be like definitionally improper of the court to start crafting rules for th for questions that weren't before the court? No. Oh, no, I, I, but what I'm saying is I'll defend the rule, but the way they applied it in this case, I don't think is defensible. That's, that feels um, nonsensical to me, though. 
if I'm creating a rule because of a particular case before my court, and then the way the rule I create is good, but the way I apply it to the particular case before the court is not Wait, good, that seems like it would be. I can give a I can give a simple um, hypo sure. for this. Okay, I can make a rule that uh, children should be nice to their parents. Mm -hmm. Now I've applied that to mean that children have to be slaves to their parents until they're age 40. Okay. That would be a bad application. The rule is good. Yeah, but I think but the, the issue the issue is that just horrible. <laughs> yeah, but the way that the but the way that rules work and the way that courts work, right? Historically is 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 through case law. You look at the application of rules to determine the yes. rule itself, right? So like let's say for instance, if here's the thing. Let's say the Supreme Court yep. said, "We have decided to make rape illegal." And then the case before the court was um, a man you know, throttled a woman, hands around her neck, and then forcibly penetrated her, right? And then let's say that Roberts and all his genius is writing about this, and he's like, well, um, it wasn't a rape uh, because the woman didn't say explicitly, no, sir, please stop having sex with me, because she didn't say that it wasn't a rape. But we do agree, of course, that rape is illegal, right? We can't yeah. say that, like, well, that's a really good broad rule, but the way that they applied it to the case is highly questionable, because now, because that, that case is going to be cited, I would imagine, as evidence of how the rule should be applied, right? People are going to say, okay, yeah. well, in a future case, we're going to say rape is bad, but look, in the Supreme Court, when this question is before the court, obviously, if the woman's not saying, no, please, sir, stop raping me, then it doesn't count as rape, so that's fine. So we have, like, the quote-unquote good rule, but if we see the way the Supreme Court applies it, then we're like, oh, well, we know how they're going to apply it, because the assumption is going to be, if it's appealed up to the Supreme Court, they're going to apply it in the same way, Right. Right. Well, theoretically. So um, then how can a good rule applied <laughs> in such a horrible way ever, how can that even be considered a good rule? You're defining the rule in the application, no? Uh, yes, and. Um, so this happens often with the Supreme Court. They'll make a decision that's kind of bad, and then they'll get another case that deals with the same issue, and they'll tone it back to a reasonable uh, level, so to speak. Uh, that sounds like Which a bad rule then. It has to be over... like walked back then, no? <laughs> that sounds like it was well, a bad why, rule then. That's why they rarely um, uh, overrule a previous decision is because usually they can say like, well, actually the holding in Trump v. U.S. was a great holding. You know, they, they kind of screwed up a bit on the, so we're just going to tweak it a bit. And then, and then it's not as offensive anymore. Mm -hmm. Um. So that is, that's what I would defend anyway. <laughs> so that they, um, yeah, the, the holding itself is like if you just read the words they said for the actual rule that a lower court has to apply. That seems fine to me. Okay. Um, hold on. Uh, Let me... Um, <laughs> I'm trying to... I want to read the part... Um, uh, uh, the, I, part, oh, fuck, I I'm in the to... fucking syllabus. The part where he says that oh, you no. can't even <laughs> use the crime in furtherance uh, as evidence for another crime. Uh, let's see. I've got the case pulled up somewhere. I can try. And it was discussing the conversation. I'm not sure if that's the word they used. And uh, in particular, the indictment alleges conversation. Yeah, that's. Nixon. I'm just reading. I'll find this. Oh, wait. Um, okay, there we go. Um, let me make sure this is the right spot. I think I found it. What page are you on? Could consider. I am on 30 of the opinion. Okay, yeah. That's okay. Oh, okay. Do you want me to read this out loud? Or are you reading it? Or, um, Well, I'm reading it, but you can read it out loud for other people. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, sure. The essence of immunity is its possessor's entitlement not to have to answer for his conduct in court. Presidents, therefore, cannot be indicted based on conduct for which they are immune from prosecution. As we have explained, the indictment here alleges at least some such conduct. 
On remand, the district court must carefully analyze the indictment's remaining allegations to determine whether they, too, involve conduct for which a president must be immune from prosecution. Okay, wait. So just to check, when he says that the district court must carefully analyze the indictment's remaining allegations, because he already said one of them was absolutely immune, you're saying that was dicta? That didn't matter? (laughs) No, I'm I'm saying as far as this case goes, that's what they decided. Okay, so then that's not, so it's part of... That's, well, wait, if you remember at the very beginning, I, I, uh-huh. we, we covered that you could have a good rule and then a bad application, and that's, that would be my argument, is that the rule they wrote is a good rule, and then Roberts applied it in the worst way possible. So is the application, um, is the application of the rule in a case before the Supreme Court, are you saying that that's dicta? No. Well... Because then in that case, it seems like that would, just, no, that would be part of the holding, No. The problem is, it's not dicta, but unless a case comes along that is exactly the same, then it can be distinguished and it's <laughs> assuming not it's, binding. Assuming it's factually differentiated enough, right? Well, right, but almost every, like, in this sort of thing, it's going to be um, very difficult to find a case with the same facts. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I would kind of agree. It's just that the absolute immunity as applied to this DOJ thing, the fact pattern, right. it, it leaves for a pretty expansive interpretation of what the president's powers are yeah. in terms of hiring and firing at the DOJ, I would say. But OK, nope. so on remand, the district, OK, so yes. and the parties and the district court must ensure that sufficient allegations support the indictment's charges without such conduct. The government does not dispute that if Trump is entitled to immunity for certain official acts, he may not be held criminally liable based on those acts. Um, But it nevertheless contends that a jury could consider evidence concerning the president's official acts for limited and specified purposes, and that such evidence would be admissible to prove, for example, Trump's knowledge or notice of the falsity of his election fraud claims. That proposal, okay, so just so we're both on the same page here, what they're basically saying is like, let's say Donald Trump goes to the DOJ. We agree that the president legally can have a conversation with his attorney general, and the president might say, hey, um, can you please investigate this particular crime? That that would all be okay. We probably shouldn't be able to criminally charge him for that, maybe, right? But if the president were to go and say, hey, listen, okay, um, I know that this is bullshit, but I need you to open investigations in all 50 states saying that we're, I need you to do this. I need you to open investigations in all 50 states, even if you can't find any crime at all, right? Yep. It seems like Roberts is saying that, okay, not only is that immune, we couldn't, and, and it seems like what um, what Jack Smith is saying, because I think they're quoting from, from Smith here, Smith is saying, fine, even, or Smith is saying, even if that is like a core function or power of the president, we could still use that as evidence that he's like engaged in this conspiracy of bullshit. Right. Right. But so that's what Jack Smith is saying. Right. We could use that to even if we don't charge him as part of the conspiracy or crime for that, we can say that's evidence of this other behavior. And then Roberts is saying that proposal threatens to eviscerate the immunity that we have recognized. It would permit a prosecutor to do indirectly what he cannot do directly, invite the jury to examine acts for which a president is immune from prosecution to nonetheless prove his liability on any charge. But the Constitution deals with the substance, not shadows, and the government's position is untenable in light of the separation of powers principles we have outlined. How is this not like the holding ruling that none of these official acts could even be used then as evidence for other crimes? It seems like it would be. Uh, Because it doesn't actually answer the question. Um, I I would argue. Uh, It sounds like the, where was that part exactly? Um, I'm at the bottom of page 30, top of page 31. It's the last paragraph yeah, on 30. I'm um, trying to find the exact phrase where, um, uh, okay. So the sentence I'm focused on is that proposal threatens to eviscerate the immunity we have recognized. Yes. It can't eviscerate the immunity if it's part of the immunity. Okay. So the immu- the Im- immunity has nothing to do with whether evidence is admissible. And I think Roberts admits that here. Wait, now, what? Now he does go on to say no, that no, wait, wait. they should they should oh, I don't understand that. Evidence. That immunity would protect all of it from being used as evidence. Well, no, immunity is immunity from prosecution. Oh, well, like, oh hold on, stop uh, because now you're in the reasonable world. I agree with you. But that's not what Roberts is saying. Roberts is saying it's not just immunity because I because I would agree because Roberts next sentence in my mind is fucking retarded. It would permit a prosecutor to do indirectly what he cannot do directly. That's bullshit. Analyzing a person's behavior motivations in one thing isn't directly prosecuting him for that. But he's saying, well, but now they can by charging him for another crime. That's what Roberts is saying. No. 
That's what he's saying. But he's <laughs> but he is but. not saying that using that evidence, um, the immunity. I don't even know how you'd phrase that. Immunity equals not using evidence. Immunity means what um, he's saying is he literally seems so absurd. That it is, but it is. But it's the ruling. But he wants to but pull a veil say over that. But he does. 